I'm going to try and apply some of this economic theory into the practical experience as someone kind of grafting at the um, not very challenging and uh, dirty coal face of housing policy for most of the last 15 years. Um, essentially, the problem that Josh has described is the problem of economic rent. Right? And there are really a, a whole series of potential ways you could try and address the problem of economic rent in a, a modern society. Uh, the first one is you can try and use taxation. Um, then you can try and use ways of actually changing the ownership structure of, of, of land itself so as to kind of divert that, that rent, uh, economic rent into different places. You can use various different forms of regulation to try and change behaviour, to try and either suppress or re-divert economic rent. Um, and you can actually in, uh, carry out a whole range of different policy solutions which may not actually change the fundamental dynamics but they mean that the problem isn't quite so bad. They mitigate the solutions. And actually, as we'll see, what governments have tended to do is that last category most, because for various reasons, it tends to be a little bit easier. Um, I'm going to illustrate that by going through very quickly a century of housing policy in the UK as, as just one example of how the problem of rent has gone through lots of different permutations and lots of different attempts to solve it through different policy solutions. And then, um, time allowing, at the end, I thought I'd give you a few insights from my own personal experience of trying to influence policy uh, from the various positions that I've had over the years as a, in the private, public and voluntary sectors, mostly as a campaigner. So, um, always good to have a Piketty graph in there. Really what this just shows is that the nature of property has changed dramatically over the years. Uh, at the beginning of this period, in the, in the 18th century, Wealth in property meant agricultural land overwhelmingly. That's by far the biggest kind of dark blue chunk there. But by the time you get up to the 20th century, that has dramatically reduced in value as a share of, of total wealth. And the real economic wealth in property is now in urban centres for obvious reasons to do with the way that the economy was changing. Agriculture was no longer everything. Industry um, and the rise of uh, commercial trading economies meant that suddenly urban centres became far more important. And obviously the, most imp uh, the bulk of urban land is actually housing. So over time, the story of how do we deal, how do we experience the problem of economic rent has simply shifted from being largely one of agricultural land to being one of urban housing land. But the fundamental economic problem remains the same. Um, by the time we get to the late 19th century then, you have a, a, a whole series of um, s potential solutions in the offering for how to deal with this problem of economic rent. And it was recognised as being exactly that. You know, late Victorian cities particularly in this country, were appalling places. You know, very, very bad slums, people living in dreadful conditions, disease was rife. In fact, London's population was exploding at this time, but only because it managed to draw in so many people from around the world and, in, and from the countryside. In fact, the death rate in London constantly exceeded the birth rate. It was so unsanitary. It just only managed to grow because more and more people were piling in. More and more people were piling in to a relatively uh, limited supply of housing. Inevitably, the price of housing went up. People spent more and more money on, on uh, paying the rent for increasingly crowded and unsanitary conditions. In other words, the, the problem of rent had uh, a very new kind of Dickensian flavour to it. Henry George proposed the first kind of category of solutions. In other words, he thought taxation was the way to do it. If you taxed the economic rent that landowners were extracting, um, ideally he said you should tax it right up to the max, 100% of that, that, as Josh described, that is income that they do not deserve. They have not earned it. It is merely uh, a windfall for them as a result of people piling into London and wanting to live in the city. Why should the landowner profit from that? Um, they should be taxed 100% on the land value increase. He was careful to distinguish, though, that if, um, if, you're a, you know, if you're a property owner and you upgrade your property and you look after your tenants and you, you know, install a new bathroom, that is value that you have added. That is, ad that is the building value that has gone up. What you are not morally entitled to is the land value, which has simply gone up because it happens to be in a place where other people want to be, where the state happens to have put in a new train line or a school seems to happen to have been built. Um, so he saw this very much as a kind of liberal moral solution that would divert the economic rent into public hands to enable it to provide public goods. He actually thought this, was, um, this would be sufficient to abolish all other taxes. Um, which, and to this day, some of his uh, slightly more extreme followers still call it the single tax. I would you know, hesitate to say that was a sensible idea now, given that he was writing at a time when the state did almost nothing. Um, 
and now we have you know, um, far, far more claims on, on public taxation. But at the same time as Henry George, and literally at the same time, he had Karl Marx, rather more famous nowadays, who proposed a completely different solution to economic rent, which was just to abolish private property, essentially. If, if all property was owned by the public, then there simply would be no economic rent to be extracted in that way. And both of these uh, ideas were very much live and very much debated uh, in, uh, across the Western world, but particularly here in, in London. By the time we got to the beginning of the 20th century then, um, David Lloyd George was beginning to really worry about this. He actually decided, first of all, he, was, um, he became Chancellor of the Exchequer, and decided that he was going to back the Henry George solution. We had to do something to solve, solve this problem. Um, it would be land value taxation. He managed to push through a bill for land value taxation through Parliament, but it caused the biggest constitutional crisis probably until the current one, um, um, because the House of Lords rejected it. Unsurprisingly, the House of Lords was uh, fill, filled with landowners. They objected to this massive assault on their power and privilege, um, and they rejected his budget, caused a huge people's um, cr uh, crisis, two general elections. He managed to push it through. But, just, but by the time they'd gone out and counted all of the land ownerships and, and valued them and done all that Im Im immense work of kind of gathering the data, the First World War had broken out. Okay, so everything paused for a while. And immediately, what happened in the First World War? Firstly, you got a massive demand for manpower, and it was manpower, so men were shipped overseas. Secondly, you had an even bigger demand for industrial labour because a huge amount of, um, of in industrial power was required for the war effort. So urban industrial cities like London and Glasgow Birmingham and Manchester saw uh, industrial wages rise, people packing into the cities to fill the new factories. A lot of women started going into the factories for the first time. Uh, did that mean that the workers got richer? Did it hell? The landlords just raised the rent very, very fast because this was David Ricardo's iron law of rent in action. If the workers get richer, the landlord can just extract all of that increase in value by sticking up their rent. And they did with impunity. So much so that uh, Mary Barber and, uh, and a bunch of uh, essentially kind of revolutionary socialists in Glasgow organised the Red Clydeside um, uh, rent strikes that more or less brought industrial war, the industrial war machine to its knees in six months flat. The British government responded with draconian rent controls so that landlords could no longer, um, they, they abolished evictions so they, temporarily, they uh, massively restricted the ability of landlords to charge to charge rent so um, to just to kind of keep a lid on this problem until after the war was over so right there you've got you know, an attempt at taxation that failed you wouldn't, um, and actually then what they resorted to was um, uh, regulation as a, as a solution to the problem of rent but it was kind of recognized that this was just keeping the genie in the bottle it couldn't last forever of course by the end of the war you've got another major event has happened namely the Russian Revolution suddenly the Marxist solution doesn't look quite like the kind of fanciful idea that it once was. The actual abolition of private property is now a genuine threat. And that's what this quote from David Lloyd George was. He's saying, even if it cost 100 million pounds, what was that compared to the stability of the state and the threat posed by Bolshevism? So what was he proposing 100 million pounds as a, to, 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 to spend 100 million pounds on as a solution? Um, it was housing. This was the, f the kind of fourth solution, the kind of politicians way out of this problem. We can't tackle the fundamental power of the landowners, terrified of revolutionary socialism. Maybe if we just built them some decent houses, yeah, they'll leave us alone. Um, there had been some attempts at this before, so public housing policy was not entirely new. In the 19th century, early 20th century, had seen innovations like this, the Peabody Estate, but funded by uh, philanthropic kind of Victorian benefactors building kind of decent housing for the working poor. Uh, Letchworth Garden City, the world's first garden city, built by uh, effectively a civil society movement of enthusiasts um, following Ebenezer Howard's book, Tomorrow, the Garden Cities of the Future. Uh, and the Boundary Estate um, in what is now Shoreditch, which was essentially the first real uh, council housing estate in this country. All of these were kind of you know, new philanthropic attempts to do something about the problem of urban slums and housing, but that's what they were. They were trying to tackle uh, the kind of the, the, the slum conditions and the, the appalling what they saw moral conditions. So notably, all of these uh, developments uh, had very strict temperance rules, and um, Letchworth didn't get a pub until the 1970s, I believe. Um, so they weren't really trying to tackle the problem of economic rent; they were just trying to deal with the kind of the, the public health and the morality. 
What David Lloyd George is trying to do now after the First World War is something different. He's actually trying to deal with the economic rent problem. And you can see that here over the course of the 20th century is summed up pretty neatly in this graph. It just shows, if you can't read it, three lines for the three main tenures, as we know them, um, in, in the UK. Owner occupation is that middle line at the beginning. You know, about 20% of people owned their own home at the end of the First World War. The vast majority of people were privately renting. In, um, and, uh, and as we've seen, that's the condition that allows you to be fairly brutally exploited by your landlord. Um, and if you're renting in London now, you'll know that it's barely any different now. Um, the bottom line is, the, is uh, social housing. This was what was invented after the First World War in, in, in any real sense. For the first time, 1919, we're coming up to the 100th anniversary of the Addison Act, when um, the government put in large amounts of money to enable local councils to build good, clean housing to rent to working people at below market rents. Okay? So you're literally taking land out of the market, distributing it, not for free, but on a, on a non-market rental basis. Um, and over the course of the next 20 years, those two options, i.e. home ownership and social housing, increase dramatically and private renting starts to collapse. Essentially, people are given the choice of security, ownership, or uh, security and ownership in home ownership, or security and cheap rent in the form of social housing. They will definitely take it over very expensive, insecure, poor quality housing in the private rented sector. So, as a result of the growth of both of those tenures, things change fairly dramatically. Um, it is worth noting that it's not just, hang on, just, um, not just the, uh, where are we on? It's not just the, the, the public sector innovation here. There is also the, um, the rise of the private sector house builder in a major way. I think someone mentioned earlier the, um, the 1930s. The 1930s was the kind of the birth of what we now know as the kind of modern speculative house builder. Individual firms that would go out and buy land not knowing who they were going to sell the homes to, raise some money, build some homes and sell them on. Um, perfectly sensible business model, built huge numbers of homes in the 1930s, and that's partly what drove that increase in home ownership. But at the same, um, that was also funded largely by building societies, which had been around for a long time, but had finally kind of achieved enough scale to really fund mass home ownership on a, on a large level. When you get into the post-war era, however, we see things take on a completely different level. Home ownership and um, first, first home ownership and then social housing actually overtake private renting as the state really kind of steps, it, steps up its action a gear. You can see the kind of post war era very much as uh, the kind of heyday of state intervention in this market because it was really doing everything. It was regulating heavily, so there were tight restrictions on credit, so that, as Josh mentioned, so that uh, banks couldn't just pump in vast amounts of money to the uh, housing system. There was a brand new planning system, which um, did not nationalise all the land. They thought about it, thought about it. Um, and in fact, the Upper Watch Committee report in, um, during the Second World War actually recommended to Churchill's government that they should nationalise all the land. But um, in the end, they decided no. They said, we will nationalise the right to develop land. And that is the slightly peculiar planning system that we still have in this country. But it also levied 100% tax on the increase in land value that came when planning permission was granted. The planning system, in that sense, was doing exactly what Henry George had wanted to do with the tax. It was recognising that the, the, the value of a location was created by society at large, represented by the planning system, by saying, you can now turn this field into a you know, luxury hotel. That increase in value comes from the, the gift of society, not from the hard work of the landowner. And therefore, there was 100% tax on that increase. Um, but there were also taxes on home ownership. You used to pay an extra, extra uh, level of income tax for the privilege of being a homeowner, um, which obviously had a, a suppressant effect on, on house prices. They, was, they, they continued with fairly tight um, rent and tenancy regulation and the private rented sector. And uh, um, credit controls overall heavily directed uh, banks away from pumping money into um, property speculation and into more productive enterprise. But it wasn't just that. You still needed the state, they still decided the state needed to be doing more to actually ensure there were enough decent homes. So you got a huge amount of state funded activity out there building um, new homes through mainly through two main programs urban renewal, a lot of it dealing with uh, the war damage and just often the, uh, the last remnants of urban slums, um, and also the, the new towns program, a whole new, whole new series of brand new uh, towns and cities that were built uh, all across Britain, but particularly in the kind of southeast where. Um, uh, 
new development corporations went out, bought up land and very quickly built um, very large amounts of new homes. That all changes, as Josh mentioned, around kind of the 1970s. Essentially, you get a turn in the economic and um, political climate away from this kind of heavy state intervention model and in favour of, uh, of a, of a deregulatory, de more liberal term. Essentially, first of all, you get a change in, in taxation. Homeowners are now the majority. Far from being a kind of privileged few that kind of could bear, bear the brunt of an extra level of tax, these are now the majority of ordinary people, and they don't like paying an extra tax, so it's repealed. Um, equally, the land taxes that the Labour government has introduced after war were fairly quickly repealed as well. Um, you start to see land values creeping up, you start to see house prices creeping up. You then get liberalisation in the... In the uh, Financial sector, particularly, mortgage credit starts being pumped into the house building and into the housing market, and house price booms and busts start. What you can see from this chart, which is just a, a version that, um, of the same one that Josh showed earlier, is that we did not used to have house price booms and busts in this country. We're kind of used to them now, but it's a new thing. They're essentially invented right here, beginning of the 70s, with the deregulation of the, of the credit market. The land market, on the other hand, had seen a series of policy changes beforehand. And these are the ones that, to my mind, are actually the most critical for, for us today. Because after that long period where both land and property prices have stayed fairly still, uh, it was these three key moments in the, the policy architecture that, made the, uh, that meant that the land market started to go crazy and started to suck more and more of the value in the economy <laughs> into this boom-bust cycle. Uh, the first one was that removal of the 100% development charge. Incidentally, I wouldn't, you, could, you can't even notice the, uh, the um, 1947 Planning Act there. It doesn't, doesn't register because actually, I would argue, it in itself did not constrain um, development at all. It enabled more development to happen. Uh, the second one was the Land Compensation Act in 1961. Essentially what this said is that when a landowner has his land compulsorily <coughs> purchased by one of these development corporations that is building a new town, the key argument then becomes how much should the landowner get? Now, this might sound like an arcane question, but it becomes absolutely central to this question of economic rent. You own a field in the middle of nowhere and the state turns up and says, I'm going to acquire this to, buy, uh, to build uh, a new town on it. Do you get the value that re um, for that uh, farm that reflects its value now as a farm? Or what its value will be when someone's put in sewers, roads, schools, hospitals and built an entire city on it? Um, landowners quite reasonably wanted to argue that they should get the full value of the uplift. After all, it was their land. It was now extremely valuable because it was going to be going to be a whole new development there. That's what they wanted. Essentially, the 1961 Act said, yes, that is what you will get from now on. And we are still in that world today. And that was then confirmed in a key court case in 1969, which meant that um, from then onwards, we have not built any more new towns. It basically becomes impossible because as soon as the state turns up with its checkbook and says, I would like to designate this area <laughs> as a new town, how much would you like for your land? The cost is prohibitive. Yeah. Um, if you do spend that much on it, you then don't have anything left over to pay for all the schools and the hospitals and the roads. So as a result, we have not built any new towns since 1969. Um, what we have done is change the way in which homes are built. So this is just the, essentially the same period, but just looking at the housing supply picture, which for my sins is where I've spent much of my working life. This just shows you how during this period in, this, in the post-Second World War, firstly, a huge amount of building by local authorities, this dark black block here. So local councils building council housing built an awful lot, but also then followed by private companies building an awful lot too. So this tells you, first of all, that there actually wasn't a kind of crowding out problem. When the state built most, the private sector also built most. They actually worked quite well together. And between them, they kept house prices, this red line, fairly stable. Right? Um, later on, when the local authority sector pulls out in the 1980s and stops building housing, the, the, the private market doesn't really respond. Right? It never fills the gap. We are still building nowhere near as many homes now as we were when the population was a lot lower than it is now. Okay. Unsurprisingly, house prices have gone through the roof, although, as Josh pointed out, that is definitely not simply a matter of supply. It is largely to do with, uh, with credit as well. Um, but this 
this chart is enough to give you, uh, I would say, the entire history of, of, of the, uh, the problem of economic rent in this country over the last 100 years. There's enough in there to feed pretty much anyone's interpretation. So I have been using this graph to sell to politicians the fact that we need to be building more homes. Look at this. We haven't been building enough, and look what happens, has happened to prices. And they've, this is an absolute consensus now in this country that that's the case. On the other hand, if your view is the opposite, um, you can say, well, actually, look at this period. Look at the 1930s. Private sector was building absolutely tons. Why was that? It's because there was no planning system, right? Nineteen thirty is fantastic. We built loads of homes then. All we need to do now is go back to a nineteen thirty position. We tear up the planning system, let the market rip, and it will solve our housing problems for us. Okay? Whereas the left will look at that block and say, "Well, clearly, what's missing is council housing. Okay? We, we need the state to get back into the business of providing new homes." So, as we'll come on to later there are many different possible interpretations of um, exactly what the policy solution should be. To conclude, though, this uh, quick canter through the 20th century, where we are now is an interesting point. We've got to a point now where home ownership, the home ownership uh, craze has started to eat itself. Home ownership has peaked and is declining very fast. Social housing has pe peaked a long time ago and has been declining rapidly as it's been sold off through the right to buy, as jo Josh mentioned, which is the UK government's policy of selling existing council housing to tenants um, at a discount. Wonderful for those tenants. They really appreciate it. They get to become homeowners at a cheap rate. Unfortunately, the stock has not been replaced, so there's less and less social housing available. Inevitably, that means private renting is back in a big way. And I'm looking around this room. I imagine most of you are familiar with the joys of private renting at the moment. Um, it's hard to exaggerate how big a shift in the kind of social experience of the economy this is. We we're essentially going back to a Victorian model of the economy, in which most people will have to spend most of their money paying <coughs> rent to a tiny minority just for the privilege of living somewhere insecure and fairly unpleasant. Okay. It's quite an extraordinary thing to have done as a nation. It's actually worse than that, happily. Um, <laughs> We, t we tend to say that the, the, the home ownership rate peaked in this country at uh, 64%. Uh, um, that's actually a gross exaggeration, because really that's just looking at the buildings. <coughs> There's a huge number of suppressed households in this country. Um, if you actually look at the families rather than the houses, there's only 51% of the families, the households that really exist, are actually homeowners. All of the difference, these are the, those suppressed households. Those are entire families or um, that are crowded into other people's houses, essentially. So only really about 50% of, 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 of people in this country live in, in a, an owner-occupied home. Which, when you, when you consider the kind of stranglehold that the idea of home ownership has on British politics, is quite remarkable. Okay? But it's changing fast. London is always more extreme than the rest of the country, and it's worth here, therefore, just looking at how much this uh, dream of home ownership has died. This graph breaks it out not just into three ten years, but four, because arguably people who have a mortgage and are buying a home in stages, effectively, are in a very different position from people who own a home outright. The kind of the, the I think the myth we tell ourselves about home ownership is it's all, always about that kind of hardworking family with the mortgage. It's not true anymore. Right? The lines crossed quite a long time ago um, for the in, the in the nation. There are now in England there are now London's exceptional, but in Lo um, but across the country across the UK. Uh, there are now more people who own a home outright than have a mortgage, substantially more. So most homeowners are just that, they just own a home, right? they, they have no mortgage. Um, in London, what you're seeing is that private rented sector line is increasing so fast that it is now the biggest tenure. It's overtaken all the others in the space of 10 years. It went from being the least common tenure to the most common very quickly. Um, that home ownership dream, it actually peaked in the early 90s. Mortgage home ownership has been in decline since about 1992. So that's two housing market booms and busts away. Okay. It's nothing to do with the finance, recent financial crisis. It's a much deeper, longer-term issue than that. What this says to me is that, um, oh, and so just incidentally, the other thing that you often hear in this country is that, oh, we're uniquely obsessed with home ownership here. Most countries in Europe, everybody rents. It's completely untrue. Um, this is the UK. Only three countries in Europe have a lower home ownership rate than the UK. Um, not saying that home ownership is the be-all and end-all by any stretch, but it's important to at least understand the, uh, 
the reality of the situation we face. What is unique about this country is the level of obsession with, with home ownership. I think we talk about it more than most other places. Although, as Josh mentioned, the, um, the other Anglo-Saxon economies have very, very similar patterns as well. So that's a brief canter through the, kind of, um, the, the history of 20th century housing policy. How do you then go about influencing that? If, if as, uh, as I do, you think there's something wrong with this system, what's the best way to try and change it? Well, first thing, obviously, you've got to, got to sub, you know, what, what your preferred policy solution is. And then you've got to work out how you're going to achieve it. Um, so to go back to land value tax, I started my career. I, um, it was, um, I didn't really think of it as a career. It was just the first job I managed to get on, le on leaving university. I failed to get a job for all the proper think, think tanks. Um, uh, but I managed to get a job with a very improper think tank um, that campaigned for land value taxation. Now, the land value tax movement has been beavering away quietly since 1910, um, you know, failing to get anywhere um, and, gra and gradually disappearing into the ether uh, as a movement. Um, you can learn a lot from campaigns that don't succeed, actually. You know, what, what have they been doing wrong? Um, essentially, there are some technical barriers to land value taxation. It is a bit tricky valuing stuff. Um, there are issues about assessment and you know, what do you count at the margins. But to be honest, these are problems that you have with any taxation system. They're not really kind of total deal breakers, although people want to make a big deal about them. Um, there is a very real problem in the form of um, cash flow, is that you are trying to tax something where there is no cash transaction. Uh, it's very easy to take money off someone when they are in the business of handing money to somebody else anyway. You just take a cut. But when you say, I'm just going to, you owe me, you owe, you owe the tax man some money just because you've lived in this house for the year, it's, it's much harder. They just don't necessarily have that cash. They might have that wealth, but you can't turn that, that house into w w um, a bit of cash to pay, pay the, the bill every year. And it's no coincidence that the, that the taxes we do have like that are the ones that people resent avoid and, and hate the most. So council tax is the most obvious one. Again, it's, just a, you just, it's the only one where the council, where the, the state demands a cheque off you every year. Um, the other one that people really resent and hate is the TV licence. Yeah. Because again, it's the one where you just have to pay in cash. Even though it's a fraction of what you will spend on VAT every year, you just don't notice the VAT because it's, it's levied on every transaction. And so that is a very real problem. But more importantly, there are absolutely huge political bar barriers to land value taxation. Firstly, it's essentially irrelevant when you try, uh, and this is what I, I discovered when you, um, when I was working for the land value tax people. Their view of campaigning was to essentially write letters to the Times or phone up politicians and say, "Can I talk to you about land value taxation?" And you know, and you could almost hear their brain going, "Land value? What is that? Something? Something? I think I might have remembered something about Gladstone and the Irish problem in you know, school." But like, basically, no. Why, why would I want? Why would I want to hear about land value taxation? It's an irrelevance to me. Um, so it's, it, it was. Secondly, if you did manage to get their attention, it's horribly complicated. I'm going to just uh, can I just please talk you through this kind of complicated scenario involving four different farmers and you know notional values and marginal tax rates. It's like no, no, you can't. Shut up. Um, and if you have managed to um, get as far as actually even explaining what the bleeding policy is, uh, the first thing I'll notice, like any tax change, is that there are some significant winners and losers, right? And in any tax change, everybody knows that the, that the winners will keep entirely quiet. They won't thank you for it at all, certainly not publicly. They might secretly vote for you, but they won't thank you for it, whereas the losers will scream absolute blue murder. Right? Um, pasty tax, anyone, anyone remember that? Yeah, every time there's a budget in this country, all of the journalists spend the next two days crawling through it, trying to find what's the tiny little tax change that you can make a story out of. And it's usually something entirely banal and stupid, but, you know, if you, can, if you can get a day's news out of blaming the Chancellor for having slapped a tax on sausage rolls, then you, know, you, can, you can get a story out of it, and people react very badly to it. In this case, it's not sausage rolls, it's people's homes. Right? You're literally <coughs> talking about making people pay for living in the home they've always lived in. People feel that kind of very kind of viscerally that that's, that's challenging. Um, you also, they, they particularly focus on the problems of uh, those who are cash poor but equity rich. So typically older people who might have bought a home for very little 50 years ago, it's now worth on paper a huge amount of money. Why are they going to get stuck with a vast tax bill? They're living on a pension. They don't have a, the income to pay it. Um, there's also something complicated about the psychology of wealth taxes. However much policy geeks like me think that wealth taxes make an awful lot of economic sense, 
they, every, all around the world, they are very, very hard politically to get through. And um, inheritance tax is the obvious one here. People hate inheritance tax. The vast majority of people will never pay it. And the only ones who do are dead. And yet still, everybody resents it bitterly. Um, and quite a lot of countries end up literally abolishing inheritance taxes entirely. There's something odd about the, the kind of psychology of, of asset ownership and passing something on that makes people very, very resistant to these sorts of taxes. Um, and these are really serious problems for, for any land value tax campaigner. There are, there, there are lots of kind of policy mitigations you can try and come up with to try and sell the policy. Well, you could make it a bit more like income tax. Say, well, could we devise a way of taking it out of your salary? Well, possibly, but remember, most people don't actually have a salary, and the whole point of tax is it's meant to be on wealth, not salary. So, you know, I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, you know, oh, oh, obviously we'll make it tax neutral. We'll reduce other taxes. Well, fine, but you still have the winners and losers, losers problem. It's very rarely going to balance out um, exactly. Um, oh, well, you know, are there things we could do to kind of mitigate the problems of those who are I know, elderly pensioners? Can we let them off it or defer it unto, unto death or whatever? Well, first then you run into the inheritance tax problem, which is just as bad. But also, I think more fundamentally, the whole point of land value taxation is those difficult consequences. If you don't follow through on it, you lose the benefit. The whole point is to tax economic rents. And if you let people off because it's politically difficult, you've kind of given up on the entire point of the tax in the first place. So, as I discovered, even if you manage, could manage to get past the, you know, it's boring, irrelevant and complicated um, barriers, there are still very real obstacles for actually implementing a land value tax in practice. And just as an example, uh, you know, we have had a recent experiment in this because the Labour Party at the last election did actually advocate a land value tax. Um, and it was immediately seized on by the right-wing press as being um, a garden tax, uh, which was just perfectly calibrated to make kind of middle England homeowners you know, fear and they were going to get hit with enormous tax bills for the, for the crime of having a garden. Um, and you know, I think it's safe to say it has not been a, a political winner. So, while I, in theory, I absolutely agree taxation in some form and some form of capturing rent through taxation is a good idea, it is extremely difficult as a campaigner to, um, or even as a government to actually implement that sort of policy. Alternatives? Um, I'm not going to go on about financial regulation very much because it's very much Josh's territory and he kind of touched on it earlier. Um, but suffice to say, that's really hard too. We have actually done quite a lot of financial innovation recently, having, I think, finally recognised that ploughing huge amounts of mortgage credit into the housing market maybe wasn't quite so sensible after the subprime crisis. We did kind of rein that in. But then even the unconventional monetary policy that followed um, meant we just pumped more money in through another route, through quantitative easing. Most of that's just gone into the housing market too, <coughs> in effect. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go on about that any, any great lengths, but... To give you one um, illustration, when I, was, when I was working at the Great London Authority, um, this was before the financial crisis, I was very worried about the housing market and convinced it was about to crash and that public policy wasn't ready for a, for a housing market crash. Um, and I was desperately trying to advocate you know, internally that, that we should be preparing. And I was given the message very, very strongly, no, we mustn't do that. And firstly, it was because, well, there's no need to. You know, this is in, in, the, in the anatomy of a, of, a, of, a, of a bubble. We were here. You know. It had gone up that much. Clearly, we're in a new paradigm. The rules are different. Something has changed. Fundamentals have changed. This time, it's different. There can never be a crash. And you heard that a lot in 2006. It was really, really prevalent. You know, this time, it's different. Um, how, how, could the, how could the market ever crash? Look at the demand. Um, you know, of course, like in every other crash, uh, it turned out not to be true. But... The first, but that was the first barrier, it was just literally intellectual. We don't, we don't accept that there is any need to deal with this problem um, because it's not a problem. Second one was actually a slightly more subtle political problem. We cannot be seen to have prepared for a disaster because then people will say, why didn't you do something about it? No one, you know, no one wants to be Cassandra. And Keynes summarised this very neatly when he described a, you know, a banker as not someone who avoids danger and someone who, when he is ruined, is ruined in a conventional way along with his fellows so that no one can really blame him. <laughs> and, and there is a lot of truth in this. When, you know, actually, we'd almost all rather go into the crisis together pretending it can't happen because then at least it won't be my fault. 
and I've, I've definitely found that in, in politics. Thirdly, there was, once the crisis did hit, there's a real danger of responding to the wrong crisis. We're always fighting the last war because that's the one we know. Um, so, for example, during the recent crisis, which is the one I'm talking about, everyone was a huge amount of effort put into making sure that we, that, they, the, um, that we had policies to deal with in a real hurry, because we hadn't been preparing for one, that there, there would be policies to deal with a repossessions crisis, because that's what had happened back in the 1990s. Loads of people had um, been unable to pay their mortgages, banks had foreclosed on them, and you know, there was a real repossessions crisis, and that was not good for people and not good for the, the party in power, who lost the subsequent election and were out for 13 years. So there was a very strong political pressure to deal with it. Of course, in reality, it was the dog that didn't bark, didn't happen. It was, the wrong, it was the wrong thing to be preparing for. Why? Well, because in the 1990s, interest rates spiked up to 17%. That's why people couldn't make their mortgage repayments. That's why they lost their homes. Whereas in 2008, mortgage rates fell to basically zero. Okay? Um, at the same time, the banks had also learned the lesson of the previous crisis and were determined not to foreclose on people if they could possibly avoid it because they knew the reputational damage and because they didn't want to acquire homes that were going to fall in value either. You ended up in a weird stasis position where the government was leaning on the banks that it had bailed out, so you know, don't repossess people's homes, the, um, and the, the banks were happy to forbear to let people off their mortgages effectively and not foreclose on them, because that way everyone could just pretend that everything was okay. Right? The losses were never crystallised, um, which was good because it meant that we didn't have loads of people losing their homes, but it also meant that we didn't get that house price cor correction. The result in the 90s of that um, crash, in that, that spike in mortgage rates, that spike in repossessions, was you get lots of forced sales. Forced sales mean prices fall. Prices falling means that affordability got right back to where it had been in the 1970s. Okay, that didn't happen this time around. We never got the market clearing. That whole generation that might have actually benefited from prices falling back down to a, a sensible level never got the chance to get back on the ladder. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through this, uh, this Josh's stuff about how other countries do uh, financial regulation better. Simply to say that there is definitely more that can be done with financial regulation to improve the, the management of the economy here, but it is really bloody hard. Which again is why actually what governments tend to do is focus on um, housing supply. Because weirdly, even though that is not particularly easy either, it is the one thing they can all agree on. You kind of think about that, that the, the chart of the house building over the 20th century. There's enough in there for everyone to say, what do we need to do? Build more homes. It makes sense to people. And this is what I found when I uh, went to Shelter, which, if you, if you don't know, is the, it's, it's a housing charity. It provides housing advice to people who are facing any sort of housing difficulty, but it's also the largest campaign organisation in housing in this country. So it campaigns for, for better housing uh, for everybody. And at Shelter, we were determined to you know, try and capitalise on the newfound interest in housing policy and use this to actually drive real change in the system. And I spent seven years there trying to change government policy to make it effectively, uh, first of all, more focused on housing, because housing has never really been a very high government priority, for the, certainly for my lifetime. And secondly, uh, to make sure that those policies actually helped ordinary people and those who were struggling to be able to, to get a decent place to live. Uh, and so this, this kind of last section is really just my entirely personal insights and experience of, of how to craft a, poli a, a policy campaign that will influence government. So remembering that the basic analysis I'm trying to sell here is uh, the same one that I started off with the Georges, the same one that Josh has described. It's that there is a fundamental problem with economic rent in this country, and that is manifesting itself now through the dysfunctional housing market. Unfortunately, that message is <laughs> irrelevant, complicated, and uncomfortable to hear. So how do you sell it to people? Well, the first obvious thing is you make it relevant. Right? You've, got to, you've got to make your message come across in a way that makes sense to people um, today. So rather than complicated economic graphs, the chicken stat. Every time we put that out, it went completely viral. If the price, if, if the price of food had gone up the same way that house prices had gone up, a chicken would now cost £51.18. Right? We did it lots of different times, slightly different numbers. Every time it worked really, really well. Um, it's just a simple way of making it clear that you know, houses are really expensive. Did you know? Um, importantly, uh, we found that if you just kept banging on that message, that would start the conversation. Because people basically already thought that. 
but you're just bringing it home in a slightly sharper, more acute way. Um, equally, we then went uh, slightly further with more detailed stuff about um, exactly how much people are having to spend on deposits. Again, none of this is particularly new news to people. It conforms with what they're already thinking, but it's problematizing it. It's making them think mm, there's something fundamentally bad about this. Next, next stage, politicians, right? So what? Why should they care? Everyone knows climate change is bad. Doesn't mean you, doesn't mean you actually do anything about it. It's not actually driving, driving my electoral chances. Ah, well, so we commissioned um, research after the last general election demonstrating that the single biggest factor determining whether people changed their votes and that, um, in the run-up to that election was whether they were a private renter or not, by far. For a while, there was talk that it was a youth quake, right? that, that the surprise surge in Labour votes was driven by young people. Actually, deeper analysis by the British Electoral Sur Survey demonstrated it wasn't. Actually, it was largely a slightly older age bracket. What it really was, was renters. Okay? So, we so we cut that analysis by marginal seats and delivered it to every MP with a marginal seat, pointing out that by the time of the next election, these renters are going to be the people that determine whether you get re-elected or not. And they're already upset, fickle, and angry. Okay? Um, in other words, you need to care about this personally. So you make it relevant, you make it relevant to them personally, and also put it in a frame they like, right? We've got a conservative government. Instinctively, if they get lefty campaign groups demanding that they build social housing, it's not a message they want to hear. Remind them that the conservatives in the 1950s made it their central plank. That was the key thing that delivered them their longest period of, um, of, of, of government in the 20th century was the promise of building more homes so that everyone could afford one. Right? And they did it very successfully. <laughs> um, Harold Millen famously built more homes uh, as housing minister than anybody else. So you, so you make, it, uh, make it relevant, then you make it simple. Back to this story. As I mentioned before, this is basically a lie. It is simply not really true that the reason house prices have gone like this is because supply has fallen. It doesn't help, but it's not really that. It's actually much more to do, as Josh said, about the, the, the credit supply. But this is what people believe. Right? And by the way, we do need them to be building more homes. They believe homes are too expensive. They believe they will need to build more. You know, it is a, it is a, a very small step to say, you know, house prices are way out of line. We've got to build more. This is how you do it. Okay? But the next step is then to add something that they don't know. So, so far, we're really just telling people things that they already believe. But you've got to get, once you've got their attention, give them something that they don't yet know, something um, extra, a bit more explanatory power. The key, the key insight here then is why? Why has the private sector not responded? House prices have been going like that, and yet private house buildings have been going down over time. What is fundamentally wrong with this market such that? Uh, it isn't responding to price signals in the way that um, people generally believe that markets should. Now, there are some who will say, ah, well, clearly, it's just the, uh, it's the dead hand of the state. It must be. You know, if the market isn't working, it must be the dead hand of the state. And you don't have to look very far in house building to find the dead hand of the state in the form of the planning system. And it's true. Those on the kind of libertarian uh, right will say, yeah, tear up the planning system and the market will provide. Unfortunately, A, the data doesn't back that up. We've been granting more and more planning permissions for decades now, and the gap between the number granted and the actual number of homes built just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Secondly, um, it's just not going to happen. The attachment of this, um, to Greenbelt politically is extremely strong. Um, and thirdly, it wouldn't work even if it did. If you know from what we've been saying about the way that the land market works, it should be clear that if you were to remove greenbelt restrictions and other restrictions on bringing land into the system, what would you get? You just get a massive speculative trading frenzy as land values spike through the roof, as a few farmers make vast amounts of money overnight for doing very little. You'd probably get a few developments springing up in all sorts of random places unsupported by infrastructure. Um, you probably wouldn't even get many more homes built overall. You'd probably just get another boom, boom, boom and bust and a few um, rich landowners. Essentially, and what this shows you is that this market does not work. Right? We cannot rely on the market to just uh, sort this problem out. We need something else. Why not? Well, here you have to go in a bit more depth. This is where we actually look at the, the nature of house building, the nature of the house building industry market. We call it speculative house building. It's not meant to be a, an insult. Um, I know speculation is often seen as a bad thing, but it's not. It's just a technical term meaning that a house builder does not know who they're going to sell the house to when they start the process. Okay? Um, they go out and they buy land speculatively because they're not quite sure. 
They never know who they're going to be able to, if they're going to be able to get planning permission at all, what they'll get planning permission for, who they'll sell the home for at the end, to at the end, and, what the, and most importantly, what price they will get for that home. So there's a huge amount of risk and uncertainty in that process, in that speculative process. And that drives an awful lot. The key process to understand here is what the, is catchily known as the residual land value methodology. How much does land cost? Answer, nobody knows. There's no sticker price. There's no standard unit of production. There's no standard benchmark for what a bit of land costs. You know, a bit of land is basically worth what, um, what, it, what, uh, what, what it is worth depends entirely on what can be done with it and where it is. Okay. So you might have a pretty strong sense that a bit of land in the middle of London is going to be worth more than a bit of land in the middle of Lincolnshire, but you don't know how much more. You certainly don't know enough to be able to actually put down a realistic price uh, and, and offer someone something for it. So what a developer does is this. They go through this um, kind of backwards process. Essentially, they estimate and say, okay, bit of land for sale. I think I can build uh, this many homes on it. I reckon I'll be able to get planning permission. So they're taking a gamble, but fair enough. Um, and I reckon I can sell those for, say, I'll say, you know, keep them math simple, we'll say I can I'll sell them for um, 10 million pounds. Okay? Now, I'm not getting out, this is a very risky business. I've got to put up my own money for this and borrow more. Um, I'm not going to get out of bed for anything less than 25%, and that is roughly the house builder benchmark. Um, so, okay, out of that 10 million quid sales price, that's two and a half million for me. That leaves me seven and a half million. Well, the, the, the local authority is going to shake me down for some affordable housing and a contribution to the local school, and they'll probably make me pay for the road in or something like that. So that's another two and a half million off. Um, that leaves me half, um, five million to actually build the bleeding things. Um, I'll spend half of that. It'll cost me in bricks and labor and concrete. It'll cost me another two and a half. That leaves two and a half million left. That's what I can offer the landowner. In other words, they work back to get the land price. Okay? Makes sense. Perfectly reasonable process. Um, the problem is competition. The developer is not doing this alone. At the same time, someone else down the road is also kind of sitting by their desk working out the same calculation. And if that developer thinks, ah, you know what, I've got very good lawyers. I can haggle the local authority down. I reckon I can get away with only a million quid on affordable housing and infrastructure provision. I reckon I can cut the quality of the build as well, you know, shave a few corners. Um, I'll, I'll sack those fancy architects and just knock up my kind of standard model. I can actually uh, get that cost down and offer the landowner five million. Naturally, the landowner is going to go with the, the bigger price. So before a planning permission has even been applied for, before anything has happened at all, the workings of this system have already guaranteed that you will build the worst scheme with the least affordable housing, with the least infrastructure, and the least the, the kind of the worst quality of build. Okay. What's that? It's just economic rent. Right? It's just the problem of rent in a, in a new form being extracted. The landowner has not done anything wrong. They're just taking the highest offer. Okay. So, what that's, this means, and we do see this every day, um, is that landowners um, routinely water down, um, or rather developers routinely are forced to water down what they can offer the community back. Um, and nowadays we expect quite a lot from the development process in terms of affordable housing, in terms of infrastructure. And that, that's partly why we end up with such identical, ugly and poor quality homes that still cost a fortune. It's also why we're building so few. Once the, land owner, once the developer's gone through that process, they're laying out a huge amount of money at risk. It's a very scary thing to do. Um, they've put out most of it up front. You know, they have to hand over five million quid just, just to you know, get, get to the starting line. They're then extremely risk averse. They're not going to innovate. They're not going to do anything too um, risky. And the biggest thing that will screw them up at that point is if house prices don't match their expectations. If they don't make 10 million quid on the final sales, they're in real trouble. And house builders can and do go bust and lose everything on a regular basis. The most important thing to make sure they don't go bust is not to sell too many homes at once, because that does actually suppress the price locally. So what do they do? They trickle them out. Make sure you never sell more than you know, a certain number of homes per site per year. So that naturally restrains the amount of homes that anyone will actually build at all. So by leaving it to the market, what we have effectively done is ensure not only we have a very volatile boom-bust system, but also one in which each peak is lower than the one before and shorter than the one before. We are slowly building ourselves down to building nothing whatsoever at all. <laughs>
So that's just an example of trying to add an, another, a, a little bit of insight to your policy audience. So at this point, um, obviously this is strung out over a campaign over many years, hopefully you're beginning to get some new ideas into your, your target audience, in this case the government. So they're not, you know, you've, you've got them with the frame of reference, they understand where you're coming from, you've made them think this problem is real, but you've also given them something to think about and something, something that thinks that maybe they've got an edge on other people. Maybe they understand something now that other people don't about the problem. Next thing is to sell them actual solutions, because politicians particularly are not very keen on problems alone. Um, and here the main thing is to reassure, because most of the solutions in house building are instinctively quite scary. They involve large amounts of money, they involve tearing up the countryside, they involve you know, building concrete tower blocks. You know, these, none of these things are things that, that, that are gonna win you votes, right? So um, first thing is to reassure, we've done this before. We used to be really good at building large-scale new house, housing systems in this country. Um, that's, the, that's Bath, again, fantastic private sector, sector development. Um, absolutely beautiful, you know, UNESCO World Heritage Site, no less. This is the Peabody Estate, showed it before. Again, Victorian philanthropists um, built loads of housing, still really, really good quality, um, much loved housing 150 years later. Um, Letchworth Garden City and, and the Boundary Estate, again. You know, the point about these, they're all different, completely different. They all respond to their local place. They're very, very um, popular. They're beautiful. They're well designed. Built by the private sector, built by the public sector, built by the, uh, the third sector. Doesn't matter. The one thing, the two things rather, they all have in common is that they are designed to be quality and affordable first and foremost. They were not built for, for profit. They were built for a vision. Right? And they could afford to do that because they got the land cheap. If any of those schemes had been forced to go through that residual land value calculation process, they would have lost. Right? They would have lost to another developer who would have just thrown up some cheap crap um, and made a fortune on it. So what we need is um, a solution that a, a government program that effectively works for high quality development predicated on the public good first and foremost, and it achieves that by driving down land prices. Okay. Um, again, just to reassure, this is, this is not new. This is what the Duke of Albany, who later became um, James II, said when he was shown the plans for the Ed Edinburgh New Town, which is actually the f earliest example I could find of a large-scale planned um, new housing development. So this is uh, in the late 17th century. Very old-fashioned language, but essentially what he's saying is, yep, great, fantastic plan, but, if you're gonna do this, make sure that when you buy the land, you get it cheap enough that you can afford to do something high quality for the benefit of the public. Right? If you want to do high quality, you've got to make sure that um, the land is cheap enough. Uh, and then again, just to reassure particularly conservative audiences that there's nothing kind of socialist about this. This is Joseph Chamberlain, uh, the great conservative of the mid 19th century. He made it very clear that he was adopting the same model in his kind of municipal revival of Birmingham. Uh, somewhere I've got a quote from Keith Joseph making exactly the same point from the 1970s. So again, you've got to reinforce that this message is safe. It's okay for you, the government, to take on board the, the message we're giving you. Um, what does it mean in practice? It means some fairly straightforward things, like just smarter use of existing government programs. Right? Stop just handing over government land to people and then wondering why they don't build what you want. You know, use your land wi wisely. Invest it into high-quality schemes. The government owns huge amounts of land. If you're going to sell it, sell it to a person at a price that allows them to do something high quality rather than just the highest bidder. Use development corporations, they work as a treat. That's how we built the new towns. We know it works. And by the way, it's how we built the Olympics. Okay? Development corporations are a very simple method for just saying public interested body, not there to make a profit, it's there to operate sensibly in the market in order to drive high quality and it can do it by buying land cheap. Dead simple, we know it works. But you know, if that feels a bit too kind of top down Stalinist, and a heavy-handed state, there's lots of kind of small-scale local varieties of this as well. Community land trusts are just doing exactly the same thing. A community land trust is a mechanism for a local community, typically a village, to acquire land, usually from a local farmer at agricultural prices, so very cheaply, for the benefit of the community in perpetuity. The farmer is, will, will usually agree to this because, precisely because they know it's not going to become a you know, multi-million pound housing development. It's going to provide affordable housing, the doctor's surgery, the school, um, and a village green. So he's quite happy to let go of that at a reasonable price, because he knows that he's not being ripped off. Um, you know, if you want something a bit more funky and modern, um, this is what they do in the Netherlands. They do this exactly the same thing, but with self-build. Very kind of uh, architecturally 
modernist. Uh, so the state acquires land, master plans it, lays in the infrastructure, and then sells individual plots to homeowners. You want home ownership? This is how you get it. You sell individual plots at really at, at cheap enough prices. Some, some simple but strict rules, like you can see here, they must come, the building must come to this building height line and must have a flat front. That's basically it. Beyond that, do what you want. Okay? So you get a kind of unity of form, because again, a lot of people are quite scared of just like allowing kind of higgly piggly housing development that looks awful. Um, but you don't actually have to control it exactly, so because equally people don't like identity at homes. So control simple, simple rules. Um, you can allow lots of people to build their own home very quickly, become homeowners, hey presto. Um, but all of this relies on being able to acquire the land at a reasonable price in the first place. And if you remember from one of the graphs earlier, the reason we can't do that anymore is because the 1961 Compensation Act tells you that landowners can always extract the maximum possible value. So you, as the polit political audience, your job is simple. You need to change one clause in the 1961 Land Compensation Act. So that was one, just one um, illustration of, of uh, trying to put um, a theory through a, a kind of policy lens and then turn it into a campaign. I hope it made sense, but happy to answer any questions.